There's a handful of singers that are guaranteed to bring the goosebumps, and Dinah Washington is at the top of the list. But it wasn't easy back then to be black, female, and famous. Tragically, Washington didn't survive it. Dinah Washington, born Ruth Jones, might have been an Alabama native, but she was Chicago raised. According to what James Haskins wrote in Queen of the Blues, a biography of Dinah Washington, her family's decision to head north not only shaped her childhood, but it had a lasting impact on her. Washington understood what it was to be different before understanding what it meant to belong. She was around three or four when they moved, and unfortunately, her earliest memories were of loneliness and otherness. For starters, her father was largely absent. The Great Depression left families with few options, and Ollie Jones' most reliable occupation was that of a gambler. Even as he disappeared for long periods of time, it fell to her mother, Alice, to support her, her brother, and her step-siblings. That meant she was often at work, leaving young Ruth to navigate an often hostile northern city by herself. And it wasn't easy. They faced extreme prejudice because they'd moved up from the Deep South, but young Ruth stood out even more because of her southern accent. It's no secret that kids can be cruel, and when she developed bad skin as a child, she was ostracized and given the nickname Alligator. Haskins wrote, There was little about her of which she could be proud. One of the main sources of information on Dinah Washington's personal life is her longtime friend, LaRue Manns, who said her childhood and family life growing up on Chicago's South Side was dismal. Haskins quotes Manns, saying, They were living in the projects, and there were rats and roaches, and they didn't have enough food or enough clothes to wear. It was the middle of the Great Depression, and uprooting the family from Alabama and moving north meant that they were on the outskirts, newcomers without the long-standing community ties they'd left behind. Manns shared one particular story that illustrates just how dire things were, saying, She and her mother had to share one pair of stockings. She had to wash out her mother's pair of stockings to wear if she was going someplace, you know, and her mother wasn't going. Once she started school, Washington became acutely aware of just how little they had, and it had a lasting impact on her. After Ruth Jones became Dinah Washington and Washington became a star, she always insisted on buying many pairs of stockings. It was something so small and specific that Manns recalled asking her about it. Washington explained, I want plenty of stockings. I don't ever want to have to wear somebody else's stockings. In 1999, the musical play Dinah was the hit of the Chicago stage. It was an opportunity to get an inside look at Washington's life, but some things weren't accurate, according to what Washington's sisters, Clarissa Smith and Estreita Dukes, told the Chicago Reader. Chief among these was the relationship between Washington and her mother, Alice. Her sisters pointed out that when Washington hit it big, one of her major purchases was a house for her mother. And they clarified that, although Washington and her mother didn't see eye to eye on many things, there was no outright conflict. Dukes explained, My mother didn't approve of Ruth's lifestyle, the drinking, swearing, husbands. But just because you don't get along with someone doesn't mean you don't love them. But from the time Washington was little, the relationship was difficult. Alice Jones wasn't just incredibly religious, she was incredibly judgmental as well. There were some records that my mother didn't let us listen to. One of them was uh, Long John Blues. Near constant criticism left Washington believing that she could do nothing right and wondered if her mother even loved her. Still, Washington always made sure to provide for her family. When she passed away right before Christmas, her sisters found their gifts carefully wrapped and ready for the holidays. Being judged on appearances isn't something that only happens to those on stage and on the screen. But for Washington, the constant criticism had devastating consequences. It began when she was ridiculed for her skin color and condition as a child, and continued when she started performing. She was regularly reminded that she didn't conform to the standard of feminine beauty of the day, and she was at best ignored even by the men in her band. Longtime friend LaRue Mann said she'd always dreamed of being something else, and it only got worse when Ebony Magazine described her as plump, good-natured Dinah. This led to a vicious cycle of not only dieting, but prescription pills and self-administered injections of mercury. Manns said that at one point, Washington was injecting herself with so much of the stuff that she would drop several dress sizes in a matter of hours. Along with that came side effects like insomnia and massive mood swings. Was it healthy? Absolutely not. People interviewed by Haskins couldn't agree on just what kind of impact Washington's fluctuating weight and insecurities had on her, but they did say the more she toured, the heavier she got. Why? because segregation was in full swing, and there was plenty of cities where Washington had zero opportunity to sit down at a good restaurant serving good food, simply because she was black. Even when Dinah Washington started to be noticed for her voice, life was far from easy. Making ends meet meant keeping a grueling schedule. She put so many miles on her cars that it was necessary to buy a new one every year. Averaging at least 100,000 miles a year, Washington and her band were on the road for months at a time. And most of their gigs were one-night stands, forcing them to crisscross the country by day while performing each and every night. 
Most other shows were at the venues on the Chitlin circuits, a series of theaters, nightclubs, and even churches where black performers were allowed to go at a time when segregation was still the norm. Well, we're talking about the Chitlin circuit. This one is the Chitlin circuit. And it's left behind a complicated legacy. On one hand, it was a series of venues that gave black performers a chance to get noticed and make it big. It wasn't easy. Entertainers were often unpaid, and sometimes they were paid in food. The man would fix us four sandwiches. And then we got so good, the guy would give us eight hamburgers. I would sell three of them and eat the others. They might be expected to play multiple shows a day before packing up and driving to the next venue to do it all over again. Sometimes while sleeping in cars and being harassed by law enforcement along the way. When James Brown was on the Chitlin circuit, he spent 51 weeks a year on the road and once did 37 full shows in the span of 11 days. In other words, it wasn't for the faint of heart. It was Patty Austin who described Dinah Washington as having a heart like the Grand Canyon, saying that once she started making money, she'd help anyone in need. But with her generosity came increasing amounts of debt. Not only was she giving to her friends, but she supported her family and paid her band, adding clothes, jewelry, hairdressers, and other staff, along with her insistence on helping out anyone who had a family emergency or other sudden need for cash, and it added up. My sister loved her furs. She even had a mink toilet seat. At one point, Washington was diagnosed with a strained larynx and ordered to take off at least three weeks to allow her throat to heal. But because she couldn't afford time off, she never truly recovered from the incident. Alcohol, cognac in particular, became a constant companion, and so did depression. Not even those closest to her knew the extent of her mental health struggles. The Ann said she found several suicide notes left by Washington, but was never certain what exactly was going on with her friend. No one knew what to do. Washington became notorious for firing those closest to her, then minutes later acting like nothing happened. Those around her wondered if something was truly wrong or if she was simply acting. No one's entirely sure how many times Dinah Washington was married, but the general consensus is that it's somewhere between seven and nine. She had eight husbands. Uh, some people say nine, I lost count. The first was a three month long marriage when she was 17, and it's a perfect example of how little is known about her. While some accounts say John Young was 23 at the time of the wedding, LaRue Mann says he was at least in his 30s and perhaps in his 40s. Washington would later say that she married him for the same reason many other women of the era chose to marry someone they weren't necessarily in love with, explaining, Seizing the opportunity to get away from home, I married him. By 1957, she had ended marriage number four and, in a rare and candid interview with the Pittsburgh Courier, explained that the reason for her failed marriages was pretty straightforward. She wanted love, security, and a family, and the men she married hadn't been willing or able to give her those things. She was the queen of the hand in your face. Like, she just did not care. According to Patty Austin, Washington took great pleasure in luring men away from their wives, recalling, she also loved to marry somebody else's husband. She bought a lot of divorces and paid for more child support than anybody can think of. It was a great challenge to take somebody else's man. When Washington spoke with the Pittsburgh Courier, she acknowledged that her fourth marriage to a man named Walter Buchanan lasted just eight weeks. She admitted that he sued her for alimony, but she left out the most heartbreaking part. Buchanan was a bass player, and after they'd married, she promoted him to band leader of what was now called Walter Buchanan's Orchestra. It was likely that Buchanan saw her simply as a means to an end, and Washington found that out the hard way. She broke things off with Buchanan in the middle of a tour, saying that she began to have a bad feeling about a relatively new husband when he started joking about how he needed a new car. Buchanan was at his father's house when Washington called him. Washington recalled, I was about to hang up my phone when I realized his phone was off the hook. There was a loud laugh and I heard someone say, you better stay with this woman and get all the money you can. That was enough for me. Bursting with anger, I told him I wanted a divorce. Buchanan didn't get his alimony after she brought up the overheard conversation in court. When Washington died in 1963, the news story was buried on page 79 of the New York Times. Early reports said she'd spent the evening watching TV with her latest husband, Detroit Lions halfback Dick Knight Train Lane. They were planning a big family Christmas. It was Lane who discovered Washington's unconscious body when the sound of the television woke him up. A pill bottle was found nearby. An autopsy found that the cause of Washington's death was an overdose of alcohol and diet pills. The Ann's had talked about her initial shock, saying that neither she nor Washington's mother believed the news at first. Her mother said she was going to continue fixing breakfast. She was so sure that Washington could walk through the door at any moment. Mann said, though, As the day went on, it finally began to hit me. I kept thinking that if I'd been out there, maybe I'd have saved her. I had just had the doctor send out a new order of pills, and they had just arrived. 
she would pass out sometimes. And when she came to, she said, why are you fools standing around in bed? Pour me a drink. Mann said that there weren't many pills missing from the bottle, confirming to her that it had been an accident. Somewhere around 30,000 people turned up to pay their respects to Washington at her funeral, standing in the below freezing temperatures to bid farewell to the 39-year-old singer with the voice of the ages. If you or someone you know needs help with mental health, please contact the Crisis Text Line by texting HOME to 741-741. Calling the National Alliance on Mental Illness Helpline at 1-800-950-NAMI-6264 or visit the National Institute of Mental Health website.